Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today we have this man I'm really excited for. He's passionate. He's been doing this for over 16 plus years. He's been speaking, traveling, giving insight and wisdom on his story and his passion and his experience. This gentleman was attacked by a suicide bomber and lived in Afghanistan and he survived and he's here to share his story and he's turned it into what he professionally does for over 16 years and help give back to people who are looking to find their niche their, and make a way in life. You won't want to miss one second of what this man is putting out. Here we go. Welcome back to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I'm your host, Marcus Norman of favorite, your favorite gentleman. And we are on all platforms, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Ghana, iHeartRadio. And today we have this incredible man, Mr. Brian Fleming, spilling the tea on his story and how he became world-renowned and sought after for his speaking and his story and how he can teach us, you, me, how to turn our passions, our stories, our real life experiences into cash and how it can cross over into business. This man is truly iconic and I'm so glad I found him for you. So glad he's blessed us and honoring us and coming to the Gentleman Style Podcast stage and sharing his story with us. So help me welcome, can't hold this man back, Help me welcome Mr. Brian Fleming. Welcome. Welcome, sir. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. It is a true honor, and I want to say this to you publicly. Thank you for your service, sir. Ah, uh, thanks. Glad I did it, and I'm glad it's over with. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It, it 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 had its time in your life, and you have transitioned, sir, and you have moved on. So tell us, but I, I tell us what was it like? Why did you join? What motivated you? What were your best times, worst times? How are you feeling today? Well, today I'm feeling absolutely great. I turn 40 next month and I've never felt more alive. I've never felt more the right to be myself. I've never understood life more yet with having the the highest level of understanding I've ever attained at this point. I'm also extremely well aware, even more well aware than I used to be of how much I actually don't know about life. And so <laughs> it's a it's a very interesting dynamic. I think uh, I think a lot of people have the idea that the more you learn, it's like a triangle or a pyramid where you eventually get to the top, you get to the point where you suddenly, you know, reach this point where you understand everything. Well, for me, it's like an upside down triangle. It's like the more I learn, it goes up and out and expands. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And that's just existence for me. So that's how much I understand. Very little. But, uh, you know, but you're I'm growing very, every day. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the more you learn, the more you know, the more I think you learn you don't know. But yeah, I, I joined the army after high school. Uh, I graduated in 2003 and down in near Miami, Florida. And this was obviously post 9-11. And so that was part of the big reason I joined. You know, terrorists had attacked our country and you can't just sit still and do nothing. And so uh, they were launching attacks from Afghanistan. So that's where we went. And uh, I ended up serving there in 2006. I was a team leader in an infantry platoon with uh, the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division. It's a... a Light infantry mountain warfare unit, and so we were there from. Well, I, my my unit was there most of 06, and I I lasted about five months. Uh, vehicles got blown up twice. The first time was on April 18th of 06. We ran over a double stack of anti tape mines buried in the road. Uh, two of my guys were injured. Both returned to duty a month later. I was not physically injured, so I stayed on the mission. But I did start experiencing some symptoms of a traumatic brain injury, but I didn't know it at the time. And then on July 24th, a few months later, uh, we were driving down to Kandahar Airfield, and I was the truck commander. So I was in the front passenger seat of the lead vehicle of about a 15-vehicle convoy. And a suicide bomber in a minivan uh, got up next to my door and slammed into my vehicle and blew up. And he uh, blew himself and his van into about a billion pieces right in the middle of the street. And... 
I woke up laying in a ditch, burned and bloody on the side of Highway 1. Had no idea where I was. Uh, my first thought was, why would I go to sleep here? Because <laughs> I didn't mm. remember lay, I didn't remember laying down there. And so I uh. thought, what, are we in a gunfight? Well, no, nobody's shooting. And so we're, crap, where's my weapon? I couldn't find my weapon. It was still in the vehicle and I wasn't. And uh, so I did sort of a push up, got to my feet. You know, my face was burned. My neck was burned second degree, face and neck, third degree burns on both my hands and um, burned and bloody and took about a half hour for the medevac helicopter to get there. And three days later, I arrived at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. They uh, did a bunch of burn treatment, reconstructive surgery, had to scrape my skin off with razor blades to uh, get all the charred, dirty burn skin off or I would have died of infection. That was actually the worst part of it all. And I stayed there for the 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 next fourteen months of my life. Wow, that's that's thank you for what you did, and thank you for for you know serving our country. That's huge. That's impactful. That's that's not easy. Did did you return to service after the, after the fourteen months? Did you return to Afghanistan? No, I was actually put out of the military medically, just due to the extent of all the cumulative injuries, physical and head injuries, things like that. For sure. What was some pros? What was some good parts about serving? Um, I always hear veterans, including myself, I always think about the times, you know, the camaraderie, right? The people oh, yeah. meet some of the most interesting people ever all across the globe. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to really bind people together, make them suffer together. That's how we're wired as human beings. If people who suffer together, um, if you don't, if you don't kill each other by the time you're done with it all, <laughs> uh, you're, you're going to come out, you know, closer than blood brothers, you know? And, um, uh uh, you know, another, another thing about the military, I think that was great was the fact that, um, I don't expect anything of anybody. <laughs> I have mm. such lo- I have such low expectations <laughs> of the world. Like, like I expect it. I just don't expect them to live up to the expectations. I mean, gosh, I got mm. out of the military and the military and I, I saw people yelling at their bosses and I'm like, Oh my God, I would have gotten punched out for that. Um, People showing up late to work and they're getting paid extra money to show up on time. I'm like, what? What in the hell is this? <laughs> right, you're right. That, you know, if, if if you're not ten minutes early, you're late. You know, and to you're this right. day, I can't show up late. I can't hardly show up on time. I have to show up early. It's just how I'm wired now. And so it actually set me up for success in a ton of different ways because, honestly, in the civilian world, the bar, the standard, and the bar is so low for excellence. Um, no offense to any civilians, but it's freaking low <laughs> and, and just yeah. the way I'm wired and the military taught me, if I just keep doing what I do, um, it stands out and I'm grateful for the military for that. It, you're, you're right. It, it is shocking and it's impactful, simple things, right? Showing up on time, wearing be clean shaven, right? Dress. Imagine that. Imagine yeah. that. <laughs> Groom yourself. <laughs> what? I, mean, I, see, I, I see guys go out on, on dates and they don't even shower or shave first. I'm like, did you even fix your hair? I'm like, I, what? It's like Howard, that was never even a question. Like, you know, you didn't even iron your shirt or get a new shirt, you know, whatever. Or it, I, I don't know what goes through people's head or doesn't go through people's heads. <laughs> the the military does do that. The military did help me in that regards. I don't think I was a very late individual, but it definitely gave me a high degree of respect for being on time. Oh, right? you were in the military also? Yes, sir. I served eight years in the Navy. Oh, heck yeah. Well, thank you for your service, man. You did longer than I did. No problem. Thank you for your support. <laughs> That's why, you know, when I found you, I had to reach out to you. I had to, t- I wanted to connect with you. I wanted to hear your story um, because um, I was in the submarine force. Mm. And so, but, you know, they were recruiting for Iraq um, at the time for people to go over to Iraq, but it was more on a volunteer basis. Um, and so, you know, a friend of mine on the ship volunteered to go to Iraq, came back and, you know, it just changed his whole perspective. Um, Cause he was a family man, had a wife, had a kid. Um, did you have those things? Did you have a wife, kids at the time? I didn't have kids, but I got married three months before I deployed to Afghanistan. Okay. And so ha- wife was happy to have you home. I bet that's, yes. That's, it, we'll be celebrating 19 years of marriage here in December. That's huge. That's that's a good one. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> Shout out to the missus. Shout out to the, the missus, the wifey. Um, that's huge. And again, you know, it, it, it changes you, it changes you, it it humbles you and it it brings a unique perspective to your side. And I'm glad you made it out that suicide bomber, you know, 
that that is there any kind of debriefing that you had to go through for that? Like, hey man, you were attacked. This is what happened. Do you recall the suicide bomber? They had to tell you. I didn't know what happened. I just knew my my medic, who was my driver, he was uninjured, and he got me and the gunner uh, to safety. You know, after you know the vehicles on fire and everything, and we were out. And then he called in the medevac. I didn't know what happened. I just, I mean, I just knew there were car parts and body parts everywhere around me. And, and, and I, I was in a lot of pain. And so, I mean, it was second and third degree burns. It's late July, Kandahar. It's probably 130 degrees outside, you know, not a cloud in the sky. So the hot sun beating down on your open burns. I, uh, I didn't know what happened until they got me medevac to Kandahar airfield. And then he walked up to my bedside. I don't know, maybe if it was two or three hours later, I don't know how long it was. But he goes, hey, uh, do you know what, what happened? I said, no, nah, man, but uh, I'm not feeling that great right now. <laughs> he goes, yeah, uh, VBID, you know, vehicle-borne IED. Uh, VBID, suicide bomber, man, he just, you know, drove into your fucking door and exploded. We didn't even see him. He just got up next to us and just nailed it. And uh, he said, yeah, he's, he's the only one who died. You know, he said, you and you and Long got you know pretty torn up, but... Um, uh, yeah, he's the only one who died. So my hat's off to him. Nice try, left-handed salute, sort of. <laughs> right, right. So yeah. the person you were in the vehicle with also survived as well. Yeah, my 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 driver, you know, who was just an arm's length to my left, completely uninjured, and mm. the interpreter in the seat behind me, the passenger seat, the back passenger seat. Uh, so it's the back seat on the right hand side. You know, he's only a foot away from me. He was also completely unharmed. Okay. But my gunner, my my gunner, he took he was a you know his chest up exposed above the vehicle, you know so he took shrapnel as well as some burns like I did. Um, but yeah, for some reason it only got me right there in that front seat. I was just in that literal hot spot, I guess you could say. Yeah, for sure. Shout out to all of everyone. You know, glad you all made it. You've done something completely unique, completely different. You've taken this in your experiences, your life lessons, and now you do public speaking for a living. Um, would you say, and before we touch on that, what are there any other skills like leadership, anything that transferred from the military that, that helps you today? We talked about grooming. We talked about just showing up on time. Those skills transferred over automatically. Literally everything. Yeah. But well, anything yeah, like, else helped you? Yeah. I mean, you know, camaraderie, team, teamwork, leadership, um, just doing work you don't want to do, putting up with it, um, staying in physical shape, uh, the mindset. I mean, if stuff gets hard, well, who cares if it's hard? You know, you don't stop when it's hard. You stop when you're done. And if the mission's not accomplished, you're still going. It's like, well, I'm tired. Nobody cares if you're tired. Like, yeah. get it done. And that's, I mean, we we had that mindset when literal life and death was the consequence of, winning or losing and so i mean i come home now and like my kids complain about doing the dishes i'm like hey i don't care like you know you don't stop when you're tired and you're whining and it's inconvenient you stop when you're done and look at the sink you're not done you know look at the dishwasher you no know, i mean gosh you have a dishwasher right you load the, you load the dishwasher you know when i was a kid i was the dishwasher i did it all by hand i had to put my hand down into that gross you know, puddle of water and the, yeah. you know, the, egg, the eggs were floating and stuff touching your hands. Got to pull that drain plug out. Like the kids nowadays have no idea, but no, <laughs> things really did. Things really did transfer from the military. I just, it's, I don't, I just don't, I don't know. I guess I probably gripe about some things, but I, I don't think the little things get me. Not at maybe, all. Maybe a couple of them, but yeah. Not, not like, definitely not like before. You're right. Is um, I, I remember in my home, I couldn't, Using the dryer was a privilege, right? So the dryer was a privilege. So you wash your clothes in the in the washing machine, and then we would hang them outside to catch the sun because that's free and doesn't cost anything. Right. No electricity, nothing. So like, <laughs> like now it's like wash or dry everything. Like no no regard. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I had to do clothes by hand, man. Like what 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 are you talking about? I had to go outside in the heat, sweating, and you're right. So it, it, it gives you an appreciation and a huge, huge pain tolerance for sure. The military, yeah. Oh yeah, and <laughs> I I do know how to sew, shine boots, you know, sew patches on, shine boots, do my own laundry. I did learn that from the army. 
That's yeah, true. There's, yeah, there's so much that you, you just, I mean, I, I, I knew how to do a bunch of that anyway. And if I didn't, I'd figure it out. And stuff's not that hard, especially nowadays. Everything's push button. Get it done. Yeah, that get it done mindset. Huge, huge, huge. Thank you. Shout out to the Army. Shout out to the Navy for continuing that process and, and showing us the way. You have done tremendous work and you, you speak to combat veterans. Again, you travel, you speak publicly, and you help people tell their story. Um, you could have done anything, right? You 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 could have retired, you could have got a regular nine to five, but you chose to share your story after experiencing that traumatic event. What what led you down the path to do public speaking? Well, the truth is that I never meant to do it. <laughs> never crossed my mind. I didn't know anybody did this. I was injured in July, July 24th, 06. I arrived at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas on July 27th, all right, that night. It was January 25th, about, what's that, five, six months later. I was still a patient at the hospital. And this guy who's an injured Vietnam veteran, combat wounded from Vietnam, Dave Reaver, one of my best friends to this day now, he came through. I didn't know him at the time, but he gave a speech to me and about 30 other guys who'd been blown up, shot up, and all that. And he was ta talking about his injury and and uh, what helped him get through things. And one of the unique things about him is that I noticed he couldn't talk about pain without making you laugh hysterically. I mean, the, the guy is, you know, you can tell he has, you know, some still facial scars and some little bit of deformation from the, the severity of the burns on his body. that were third degree from a phosphorus grenade that blew up next to his face. And so it burned half his body off. And he's talking about pain. And he can't make us stop laughing because he's cracking all these jokes about it. And it was so healing. And I talked to him afterwards, just saying, hey, man, thanks for being here. That was really cool. And we hit it off. We became friends. And basically what he at some point said was, you know, Brian, if, Brian, if you're interested, I, I can show you how to do something with all this. And hmm. at that point, he had built multiple companies, some international organizations, done very well in business extremely good speaker he speak to any crowd any crowd and do amazing and he'd also been married to the same woman for over 50 years who he married before he right before he went to vietnam similar to my story with afghanistan and so i i looked at that and i thought well one i'm an infantry guy and i'm injured i don't want to be a cop when i get up i'm done dealing with the scum of the earth and then two if i could accomplish a tenth of what this guy's accomplished by the time I'm his age, I will have lived a successful life far beyond whatever thought or dreamed I could because the guy, I mean, the guy is very successful. And so I took him up on his offer. I said, yeah, what is it? And he, what he, here's what he did. He taught me how to share my story from a position of value. Meaning I wasn't just going out and talking about myself. Like, Hey, I got blown up you know, at that time in history in 06, there were a bunch of guys like me with blown stories right. so it's like it was right. nothing new especially at the medical center there are, i mean so many guys there injured far worse than i was right. and so my whole thought was well who cared about my story and why would i share it? i didn't mind sharing it i just didn't think anyone would care or want to hear it right. but here's what happened he taught me how to share it from a position of value meaning i was able to see problems and battles i had fought and overcame and i realized other people had those same battles even if they had a different experience in life than me and so my story became the platform but the positioning of it was not just about my story it was about what i learned through my story the lessons i learned that can help you win the battle you're facing right now and that's when people start perking up and going wow you have a pretty crazy survival story but you know that's actually really helpful for our audience because they're trying to be more resilient right now they're thinking about giving up and quitting and they heard your story and you didn't give up. And plus you talked about the things that the ways you thought that allowed you not to give up that they can apply right now and get an outcome in their life. That's what using your story is all about. Powerful. Which, what have you gotten the most feedback on when you tell your story? Do you, do you, cause people probably come, more than likely come up to you the same way that you approach that gentleman. And mm -hmm. so what do people commonly say? Hey, man, you've helped me with this. You've helped save my marriage. You've helped save me. What, what are some common things in sharing your story people have approached you and said has helped them the most? I think it's resilience. It's 
it's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like saying like people come up and saying man you know i i didn't go through what you went through but i'm dealing with this right now but you know if you can get through that man i i i i, I can keep pushing a little harder on this i can keep going longer on this with whatever they're facing and the biggest example of that happened the very first time Dave ever put me on one of his stages. This was like a month, a month and a half after I met him. Mm. And I didn't know he was going to pull me up on stage either. I was still in burn bandages. My my face was still kind of pink from the, the second degree burns healing. And he brought me up on stage, gave me the mic and said, Get, you know, take two minutes and tell him what happened. And I turned. And I didn't realize that the the uh, the auditorium had filled in. There were three thousand people there that night, and I basically I said, you know, something like, "Hey, I'm Brian. I got blown up. Guess I'm still here for a reason. Go for it." Probably the worst motivational speech you've ever heard. I mean, don't bank your life on that. But now that was to me. Right. But here's what happened: when I got off stage, my life changed, and here's why. There was a one degree shift. Something happened once I went down those steps and I was off stage for about five minutes. Here's what it was. There was a young lady who came up to me. She was probably in her mid twenties at the time, about my age. She walks right up to me and says, you know, Brian, I was raped and molested growing up as a, as a child and all throughout my teen years. And my boyfriend was abusive and we broke up recently. And two weeks ago, I tried to kill myself, but I failed suicide. And I was just, I, what do you say to somebody like that? I was like, wow, just, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Are, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? I, I didn't know what to say to her. And that was, she just walked up and put that on me. Right. And right. then she said this though, but this is what changed. She said, you know, but if you can survive all that, referring to Afghanistan and my injury, she said, I think I can get through all this. And I wow. knew right there that lady's not going to go home and put a pistol in her mouth and pull the trigger or drink a bottle of pills. And suddenly I realized there was, she was helped even though I didn't have any advice for her. What I also didn't realize is that she actually helped me. And I don't think she knew that either because what happened in that moment, I didn't know this for a number of years, for a number of years later until I read a book, my life changed in that moment because I, I found meaning in my suffering when I found that she was helped by the suffering I went through and I didn't know how to explain it when people would ask like, what, what was the, the big thing that helped you move forward mentally or whatever. But I read a book called man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. He's a Holocaust survivor, lost his whole family, survived the Holocaust, a uh, brilliant guy, Austrian Jew. He's a psychiatrist. And he said in his book about suffering, he said, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. In some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds a meaning. So you might still be suffering, but suddenly it becomes something a little different. It's not exactly what it was before when you're suffering for something you believe in or some good has come from your suffering. You perceive your suffering different. Make sense? Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes huge amounts of sense. And, and that is, I'm putting it up on the screen. That's huge, right? Because we need that. We need examples like you who show us and, and tell us about ourselves through your story. And so I can imagine coming down those steps, that girl telling you, listen, I just tried to take my own life. I've been molested, um, not only growing up, but recently by my boyfriend who I just broke up with. And None of that. She she compared none of that to what you went through and said, I think I can make it till tomorrow. I, I think I can make it, you know, another day. And that's the, the power in sharing your story. And that's why you now help people share their story. Do I have to have a crazy, ridiculous story in order to share it in, in public speak? Or what? No, what are, no what? absolutely not. And here's the thing. If you look up most highly successful, famous speakers like say in the past 30, 40 years, there are some of us who have crazy stories. You know, some guy sawed his arm off when he was stuck under a boulder, you know, Bethany Hamilton, you know, got her arm bitten off by a shark. I got attacked by a suicide bomber, but most highly successful speakers you'll find, they do not have what would be 
to be these insanely extreme, crazy life stories of survival. Now, it does help if you have that because it, it's kind of noticeable. It grabs attention. But look at most successful speakers out there. Uh, they don't have an insane, crazy life story. But what they do, what they do very well is they pick problems that people deal with. And then they look and they say, well, I want to help people solve that problem. And I'm going to have my solutions for it that can help them. And then they go build a career around it. Mm. So there, it, it's not about our stories being extreme or comparing them. It's about helping people solve problems. That's how you, that's how you run a business. If you're not solving problems, you don't have a business. Facts. <laughs> and it's Is not, it? it, it's not that it, I never got any of this for the business of it. I didn't know anyone did it. Like I said, but you have to know how to be financially productive because if you can't make money doing the thing you like, you can't help very many people and you're not going to be doing it very long because if you're like me, you got bills to pay and kids to feed. Facts. Super facts. That's huge right there. <laughs> huge, huge, huge. Now you, you coach to this and you teach to this and you educate others on, on, on doing what someone poured into and gave you how to get paid for sharing your story. What are, can you share some tips today on gentlemen style podcast? Um, mm -hmm. Can you share some tips on what common mistakes people make when trying to share their story? Right? Yeah. Yeah. One of the big mistakes, and this is going to sound very counterintuitive, but one of the big mistakes people make is they talk all about themselves. Mm. Now, some people might be thinking, well, I'm using my story. I'm sharing my story. Why would I not talk about myself? Well, it's important to include your story within your presentation, within your talk, your speech. But it's the whole thing can't be about you. I'm, in a full 60 minute keynote speech that I give, I only talk about my like my war injury life story. I only talk about that maybe 10 percent of the talk after the first it's within about the first 15, 20 minutes tops. Then after that, I don't talk about it again. I might reference back to it if I'm making a point. But beyond that, I'm talking about whatever the overall message is I'm there to talk about and the lesson points and the stories that go with those lesson points that are leading me toward the end of the speech and you know the ultimate lesson I want people to get. So for example, my speech that I've been giving for over 16 years is called How to Stand Firm When Everything Around You Was Blowing Up. I talk about the top habits of the, the world's most resilient people, you know, from pe people who've, who have survived crazy things and they, they were able to get back on their feet and live a productive and healthy life afterwards. Not everyone can, not everyone does that. And so I, my speech is about these different habits that I've identified through all these resilient people and how you can apply them to your life. So my actual story, the suicide bombing, you know, that we talked about a few minutes ago. I get that out of the way in the first 15 minutes and then I don't hmm. go back to it unless I'm, unless I'm calling back to a particular part of it in order to make a point that applies to people. So this whole, the whole speech isn't just my story or just about me. It's, it, it's, I don't talk. I know, I know not to talk too much about me because no one really cares about my story. Mm. What they do care about is what my story can do for them. That's why companies will pay you money to share your story. It's because they believe that you sharing your story is going to help them accomplish something that they want. Within the organization and push their yep. people to do something. So does someone, what, how much does it cost? Does someone already have to be rich in order to start speaking or I need can to have talk? a couple books? <laughs> yes. Can you talk? <laughs> no, you don't need a book. You don't need money. Uh, it's actually, you can get started for your basically free you don't i mean if you just put together down on paper just you know some some little scribble about the problem you solve and what you can present them and you go talk to people who have groups who deal with that problem they're going to see value already how much should it cost to grab a pen and paper and write it down i mean uh, yeah, the cost of pen and paper yeah powerful i mean so i mean it, it's good to have a website and to have other things. So there are costs you incur, but it's crazy that for starting a speaking business, you're talking like from zero dollars, just scrapping it out. You can start if you have no money to gosh, I don't spend more than a, a 
couple hundred dollars a month running this thing. And when you when you get paid, the profit margins are massive because the overhead's so low. I don't need an office building. I don't need 58 employees. <laughs> like, right. I like, I mean, I'm in my freaking basement right now doing this. And this is where I do all my stuff. When I do virtual events, I sit right here and do it. And I get paid to do those. How much does it yeah. cost me to go from my bedroom upstairs to my office in the basement? Nothing. You know? No. And if I had to travel to get there, they pay for my travel. They pay for my hotel and they pay me to come. So it's like they, you don't have to, to be rich, but a lot of people do get rich by speaking because there's a lot of money in it. I didn't know that in the beginning, but also about a book, uh, you wouldn't No, you don't need a book to get started. In fact, if you did have a book, you, you wouldn't, if you had to have a book to get started in speaking, people who aren't speakers don't realize they probably wouldn't even know what to write the book about because you have to know what people want, then give it to them. Because once you write the book, that's the only the first half. The second half is selling the darn thing. And if you write a book nobody wants, guess what? Put all that time and money into producing a book, nobody's buying it. But if sure. I go speak, if I go speak to the next 30, 40 audiences and they're like, yeah, we would love like a book on like how to grit, have more grit and resilience. Or how to overcome, oh, well, here's a real example, how to overcome issues of post-traumatic stress and post-war coming home from war. Well, I wrote a book called Redeployed. I co-authored it with my combat veteran buddy, Chad. And we talk all about that. So we saw that the military had, you know, PTSD issues, marriage issues among the service members, all these other things. And so we took those issues and we talked about how we worked through and passed those into a book. And, oh, pretty amazing how suddenly people want it. It's redeployed. It's how combat veterans can fight the battle within and win the war at home. Before we were speakers, we wouldn't have known necessarily, you know, to make it about that or exactly how we did it. But right. because of the feedback we got from people and we knew what they wanted, then we wrote it. So you wrote you and your your friend, your friend wrote the book on for veterans on how to successfully fight the battles and deploy on mission with the battles in their own lives, not necessarily to, to peacetime war. Yeah. Like when you come home from war and you're different the you know, the common issues you face, uh, we talked about how we've dealt with them productively and other people we know and, and ways that were not productive that we saw people do that way. At least you have a look, you have a list, you have some information of a guys just like you who did deal with it and other ways that other guys just like you were not dealing well with it. And it, it didn't end well for them. And so we, it was a resource that was helpful and it was right in your face. It was direct. It was easy to understand. And as well, people need it. Can you, can you share two points on, on my show? We talk about relationships a lot. And, mm -hmm. and so can you give two points to help people do better in their relationships? Because you were deployed, you, you, you went overseas, you spent exorbitant amounts of time away from your family, your wife. And you're still married today. Can you share some tips, secrets, concepts, things that men should do and focus on in their relationships to have a successful long-term marriage? Yeah, I would say the first thing is be a productive man. Like get off the damn couch. Don't be one of those guys who just sits around on the couch and isn't productive, isn't going anywhere. Um, that's not attractive to a woman. <laughs> now you might already have her married and you're like, oh, she's not going anywhere. Well, would you, have, would you rather have a wife who's more attracted to you or less attracted? You know, just because you're married doesn't mean she's going to be throwing herself at you because she's so attracted to you if you're not going somewhere in life. I mean, in my experience, this is a general statement, but in my experience, women, or let's say my wife, for example, loves being a part of something I'm doing. I'm a train and I'm moving. She likes to be able to jump on board and go along for the ride and to be a part of the journey. But if I'm, if I'm just sitting around doing nothing, well, unhealthy habits tend to, to come up when we sit around and do nothing for too long. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's like, you know, if you have, if you have no mission in life or no, nothing you're working towards that's meaningful to you, you'll, you'll sometimes tend to maybe start drinking too much mm. or you have some other advice. And so you have to look out for that. And another thing for me, for me personally is, is physical fitness. I'm in, I'm in the gym four to five days a week. I run, I hit free weights. Um, it keeps me healthy. My mind is healthier when I work out days. I don't work out. I don't feel as sharp. I don't feel as motivated. I don't feel as 
amazingly good physically, mentally, and emotionally if I didn't work out that day. So that that all plays into relationships, though, you know, with how we treat other people. I will often be after after a hard workout and I come home. I'm I think I'm I think I'm a lot more patient because I'm yeah. too tired to be impatient. <laughs> I'm just like, no, oh, I'm so tired. Just whatever. Like, yeah, it's fine. Oh, you messed that up. OK, it's all good. Yeah, that's but, real. <laughs> but if I was sitting around doing nothing and I was mad at myself for something I didn't do that day and I felt like a loser and so and I've had those days, too. They, those come along every now and then then I'm a little more touchy. And then it's like, Oh gosh, what's wrong with you? I didn't do anything to you, Brian. And it's like, it was in, in those days, it was often never about her or the kids. It was something they didn't know that I was mad at myself about. So I was on edge with me and I've gotten better at when I see that, when I realize that happens, calling it up. I'll tell you, I've got one saving grace. I got one good thing on my side. I am not perfect. Nowhere close. Here's one thing I have on my side. If I'm wrong, I'll admit it. If I mm. do something wrong, I'll admit it. I don't even care. I, I don't have an ego big enough to destroy my relationship over admitting that I legit messed something up or I was rude somewhere or I was wrong. Now, if I wasn't wrong and I wasn't intentionally being rude, you're going to have to shoot me before I admit to being wrong. Like right. I won't <laughs> like I'm an extremist on both sides. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I get I got suspended in high school because of that, and I've even ha been one or two run-ins with the cops in my younger years where I didn't do something they said I did, and I'm like, they just admit to it. I'm like, no, I won't because I didn't. And I, I remember I got suspended from from high school for like a week. And the guy's like, all right, you can admit it or get suspended. Well, my my mother lived two thousand miles away, and my dad was in jail, so I was living, living at my grandma's house, and she worked all day. I said, okay, it's Tuesday. You tell me I can't come back to school until next Tuesday. He goes, yeah. I'm like, deal. Okay. Deal, man. <laughs> I was like, wow. Okay. Bummer, man. Dude, I went home and I played Nintendo 64 for a week. It was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I was failing anyway, so it didn't hurt my grades. I was like, so you're, you're punishing me with vacation. <laughs> <laughs> with time off. Yeah. Say I'm gonna send you home. Like that's everybody's dream is to go home. <laughs> like don't threaten. Yeah, don't threaten me with a good time. Uh, he did, and I had it. <laughs> that's huge. That's huge. You also mentioned something about grit, and I feel like that is sorely lacking in today's society. We are not tolerating the things. We're not putting up with things. You mentioned earlier that your kids are like, "Oh, I don't like doing this. I don't <laughs> like doing this. It's annoying. I don't want to do dishes." It's like just do it anyway, right? How important important is having grit in 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 some in a man's life well i think it's everything i mean it's your ability to withstand the the cold winds and the breezes and the storms that will come against you in life mm. and you know it, we're fortunate for all the technology and um infrastructure we have especially here in america to make life as easy as it is it's not always easy but i was born in the 80s the early 80s. I remember life before the internet. It mm. was it was different. Things are a lot easier nowadays and in a lot of ways. And as a result, you know, people haven't been quote doing their push-ups for 10 or 15 years because they sort of haven't needed to metaphorically speaking. And now when when things get hard, you got to be strong. Well, you have a lot of people who have, you know, skinny arms and no upper body mass and chest muscles because they haven't worked them out in years. And it's like, I'm so grateful for the first time in human history, we're living so amazingly as we are. You and I didn't have to go hunt our food this morning or tonight or, <laughs> or, or die, you know? <laughs> right, right. Like most of human history, that's what you and I have had to do. Right. Our, our ancestors did that because they would die if they didn't. You know, I, I mean, my wife's picking something up from the store on the way home. You know, I'm not even there and the food shows up, you know? <laughs> like so, magic. But we're still human beings and life is still brutal and just, it can be, it can be beautiful and it can be just brutally awful. And if, if you don't have things that continually challenge you, you won't ever develop thick skin and the ability to endure. Like I was speaking for, I was at bank of America a couple of years ago down at their headquarters in somewhere in North Carolina or something. And one of the audience members, the guy asked me, 
he says, I have a, I have a teenage son, like 13. How do I, how do I help him develop more resilience? You know, what I told him, I said, put him in hard situations and don't let him out. Like make him fight his way out. Don't help him. No, on purpose. Not, yeah. On purpose. And there's that, that sounds kind of brutal. And I used uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, <laughs> as an example, because uh, that'll show you where that'll show every human where they're really at mentally. Um, when you get choked out by a woman twice your age and half your size, <laughs> um, <laughs> knows what she's doing. And you're like, I'm a combat veteran. She's like, you're going to sleep, mofo. You know, <laughs> but, you know then you're tapping like, all right, stop, grandma, stop. You know? <laughs> you know, she's got a brown belt just choking you with it. But life, life is brutal. You have to kind of, like, I constantly throw stuff in my kids' ways, like to, to help, help them like have to do stuff. Cause that's how life is. You can't sit around on your iPhone all day. You know, when you're an adult, you can't just sit around your phone all day and not work and chill out. Not unless you're making money doing it. Right. You might have to do jobs you don't like and do work you don't want to do. Well, if you want money, you want to survive. Sometimes you have to do that. You you are speaking to something that I have have been saying for a really long time, right? I've I've worked. I, I'm now currently self employed, but when I was working in, in corporate America, I would oftentimes come across men, women. Oh, it, it, job was having a job was just kind of this 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 thing to do. It was like the cool thing to do, and it, it's called quiet quitting. They would just work the job, and then something would happen at a job, and then they were just like, "Oh, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm gonna go home." And I'm gonna leave the job. I tell my girlfriend, um, who who we the goal is marriage and the goal is children. And so I tell my girlfriend, when we have kids, I have no intention of babying any of them. I have no intention. If you go to work and you decide to leave your job just because and it's your fault, you please understand you're not just coming home. That's not going to be comfortable for you. You're not going to chill out for weeks on end while you decide to look for a job. It's going to be uncomfortable. It, it was the craziest thing. During the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I met a girl online. She was asking me for money. She doesn't know me. She's just Facebook, social media <laughs> friends with me, right? And she's asking me for money because she's about to get um, evicted from her apartment complex. Why? So I do some digging because you're asking me for money. So I deserve to know why. Yeah. She had... She saw what everybody else was doing, right? They were getting PPP loans, stimulus checks, and the um, unemployment $800 a week thing. So she purposely got fired from her job. She showed up late, didn't do what she was supposed to do, doing below minimum to stay employed so her employer would fire her. So her employer fired her, and she immediately files for this um, unemployment. She gets the $800 a week. She starts upgrading things in her apartment. She buys. Yeah, that, her two that's bullets. called, that's called being a loser. Yeah. Yeah. So we <laughs> see it all the time. We see it all the time. And she's, yeah. she's purposely not doing what she's supposed to do. Now, please understand. You're not going to come to me as a parent and say, mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't feel like going to work today. So mom and dad, I quit. Um, when is dinner? Well, first off, that's that. Let's talk about this. You need to have a plan to get back to work mm -hmm. or you need to apologize to your boss and say, give me a second chance. But you're not coming back because you have no grit. You have no no pain. You need to suffer a little bit. Well, I mean, what if something happened? I mean, with your kids or mine, what if something happened to us when they're 20 and we were always the one that came home to? Well, guess what? Home ain't there no more. It's like bird get out of the nest, you know, and that's that's the way life is. Now, that's what true. that lady should have said was. In her message to you, hey, I don't want to ask for money for nothing, but I'm in hard times. Can I clean your house? Can I paint your house? Can I, you know, whatever you need done, like, can I babysit for you? Can I, that way she's exchanging value for money and she's actually respectable and she can actually feel respect, respectful of herself because of it. But just asking something for nothing, I mean, there's a certain level of people who don't who once they find out you're that way they won't associate with you and i'm i'm not better than anyone but i'm not part of the freebie group like right. you will never ask me you'll never see me ask for anything free now if you offer me something free i grew up poor i'll take it right. <laughs> but, right. but i'll never ask for free i'll i will constantly try to find what can i do that's a value for you that's an even exchange and i can give you more value than the money i'm asking for
That way we both feel good. And you don't look at Brian and say, man, that guy's just kind of a bum. You know, that's, that's not who you want to be. And the problem with those people, they never rise above that level. That's a ceiling. And if, if they're that way now, most of them don't ever go beyond it because they hang around other people who are that way. And then they complain about there's no opportunity. Like I started a speaking career talking about the worst pain in my life ever <laughs> without any training. Like I didn't, I didn't know anyone did this, you know, so I just, true. I mean, it's amazing what people can do. You could have given up. You could have, I worked at the VA. You could have been like those so many veterans uh, yeah. that are just hanging out, chilling out, trying to bump up their disability claim, bump up their medical claim. Yep. And and complaining about how little they're receiving. Oh, I deserve more. I deserve this. I need this. Y'all need to pay for this. I need to, y'all need to pay for my housing. Y'all need to upgrade my car so I can have this scooter, you know, all kind of stuff. And it's just, it's a free for all at the VA. They literally sit at the cafeteria talking about yep. how they can get more money from the government for doing nothing. Like, <laughs> hear me for clear. something I'm they not, did I'm not... 30 years ago. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the the you served, and I love that you served, and I thank people for what their service. But it's what you did. The military is what you did, right? It's not it's not you. You have to reinvent yourself. You have yeah. to have grit to push through the injury, because you're you're no longer you're you've been injured, but you're not done. Does that make sense? Because if you were done, you'd be dead. Well, I was 22 years old when I got out. Like my life was just starting. It's not right. over. I mean, if your life goal is to see how much more you can get from the VA, that's like the biggest finish line. And you've been out of the military five, six, ten years or more. Like, man, like get a new fucking mission, man. Like, that's what you have to do. And the in, in the military, they give you the mission. You get out. If you don't make the mission, there isn't one. And that holds a lot of guys up. That holds a lot of well, men and women, I say, service members, veterans. It holds them up because they don't realize, oh, I have to make the mission now. Right. Getting a job building a business, doing work that matters to you. Like you create the mission and then you go accomplish it and you, you know, however you do that. But yeah, you can't just sit around and do nothing I, it, because then you're just miserable. You have all this weight. I, I'll tell you the worst part of that is I think deep down people know they have more potential for doing more than they are. And if you're doing that, if you're just sitting around, it eats away at you because you know, you have more potential to do in you but there's something inside you holding you back and it eats away at you. Like my, my worst days are days. I'm not completely exhausted from working. If I had too much free time, I feel like hell. It's like, I didn't do enough today. I could have done more. And that's just how I'm wired. Not everybody. But I feel you and me, I feel like that's how most people should. My, my where I work, the environment that I work in, there's a veteran. He's, he's now he now finally got terminated from, from what he was doing, but he would do exactly what you're saying. And he often would come to me and he would just talk about things that I don't even care about. Right. I don't care about what you didn't do this weekend or how lazy you were this weekend. And he finally walked up to me. He's like, Marcus, do you have a problem with me? And I told him, no, I don't have a problem with you. I have a problem with people who are lazy and I just don't, I don't respond. I don't engage because I don't speak that language. When you're busy, <laughs> you're busy. He's not like, dude, what do you need? Get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 insane and it just blew me because he's a veteran but he did exactly what you said got out at a young age and then just mm. just coasted for the and do you and ever he, wonder what happened because i don't know about your time in the navy but my time in the army my role in the army nobody ever taught me to be that way i would get my ass kicked if i tried acting that way but but then some of these guys get out and it's like they just forget everything that they did for four or eight years and it's like, you know, that isn't how you acted in the military. That was not what you were taught. That is not your pedigree. Where did you learn this laziness and entitlement? Like, the military didn't teach you that. At least not when I was in. Right. It, 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 it's, it's the craziest thing. And I think you said it earlier. They're looking for the next mission. But they're waiting for someone else to tell them what to do. And sometimes or you don't realize that's the case. I was fortunate that I, I did. But like that's something that could actually kind of go as a blind spot for some people until it hits them hard enough. So I actually understand that. But you were a leader. 
So yeah. you were the one giving the mission. So you understood, okay, I got to pull from here. I got to get, I got to reach up to this command to see what our next mission is. I got to look um, two weeks down the road to see where my guys are going to be so I could get them prepared. Do I need to sign my guy up for small arms training to get him ready? Oh, I got a new guy onboarding. You were a leader. So you were constantly- All the equipment, spot checks, everyone have everything food to ammo to navigation plans what's the mission where are we going mission brace like everything yeah i was watching the movie fury and that that leader he was like hey go get some chow and i want to see you eat it because you would that's a simple thing that we all forget to do is just eat we go through the whole day and we don't eat a sin it's like hey what'd you eat today oh nothing well, well that and you don't eat before your guys either you mm -mm. like we're in my platoon like in, in the infantry world i came from you never you'll if we're all eating together, you'll never see the squad lead, team leader, squad leaders, and platoon leader, platoon sergeant. You will never see the leadership eating before they're lower enlisted. We get what's left over at the end. Facts. Yeah. Facts. So, mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, I'll, I'll be grilling out at the house. I'll be yelling at the kids. Come on, hurry up. Come eat. Because I just grilled all this stuff, and I want to eat it hot. But I'm not going to eat it for you. Like, it's like, no, go ahead. My wife's like, you're okay. Go ahead. I'm not doing it. That's a, I'm not wired that way. Just, you know. <laughs> Get everything. Get in there. You're right. You're so right, man. You're so powerful. So, so powerful. And I, I, I appreciate that, man. I, This has been an epic interview and a conversation. I, Mr. Fleming, I want to say to you publicly, Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. And I, I pray that you don't ever give up. Well, I appreciate it, man. Same to you. Thanks for having me on. And uh, by the way, if any of your listeners have heard this today and they're asking, they're thinking, man, I would love to share my story, but where do I even start? Who would want to hear my story? How could I even start down that path? Well, I've been there. And I know the path. I've been walking it for almost 20 years. So if anyone's interested, if they want to know how to use their story through public speaking, go to useyourstory.com because I have a free resource there called the free Share Your Story Roadmap. Now I'm going to show you how to make your first $500 speaking and making a difference sharing your story. It's totally free. It costs nothing. So go grab that at useyourstory.com if you're interested. Absolutely. So our audio listeners, that's www.useyourstory.com. Mr. Fleming, you've given so many nuggets this episode, so many tips, so many insight. If you had one more round in the chamber, if you had one more nugget to share, what would you say to that young man, that young girl that's afraid to start their speaking, that's afraid to share their story, to afraid that they've been molested, to share that they've been raped as from their boyfriend or, or just or attempted to take their life? What would you say to them right now watching this show? Your story has the power to, trans to transform the world in ways you have no idea and you can't imagine. And your story matters. So go do it. Facts. Facts. Change the world. Sir, I want to say thank you again. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making time for being on the Gentleman Style Podcast show. This has been epic and necessary. I want to leave you all. I got nothing to come behind what this man just said. Get on that website again. That's www.useyourstory.com. Check him out and get connected. Like we end every show, we are out of time. We got to let this incredible man go. He has many more stories to share. He has many more people to help. He has much more insight and wisdom because he's not done. He looks he looks like he's still in his 20s, y'all. If you're <laughs> for our audio listeners, he... He's a, he's a fit in shit guy. He wasn't kidding. So like I always end, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending time with us. And thank you for engaging and learning more. I hope this message helps. I hope this helps you take your business, your idea to the next level and know that you are not finished. And if you would like to share your story, reach out to a professional, reach out to an expert on how to do it the right way. So you avoid those pitfalls and those mistakes early on. Like we end every show. Take care of your family, take care of your home, and take care of business. This is Marcus, your favorite gentleman, and the incredible Brian Fleming of UseYourStory.com. Love you guys. Bye.